to this computer. Okay, so we're all set. Um, today we are talking about optimizing your lymphatic system. I am so happy to bring to you this topic. I, I love the lymphatic system because it's one we don't normally think about and it's um, part of what I love, which is detoxification. It's a huge, it plays a huge role in detoxification. And so I'm happy to bring this topic to you today. So many of you actually typed in and let us know earlier what you were interested in, why you were interested in this topic. And it's all, it sounds like we're all on the same page. So many people understand that it plays an important role. They just don't exactly know what it is or what to do with it. Some people have had some actually pretty serious um complications with their lymphatic system and so they're definitely tuned into the topic but we'll go ahead and get started with the basics so that anyone who um, joins us and they know nothing about the lymphatic system can have a clue okay so let's see make sure i can change slides for you all right, so um, the role of the lymphatic system, it works actually very similar to the, or it's set up similar to the blood circulatory system, but its major role is to um, play a major role in your immune health. And so when we go through the anatomy, you'll start to see how it does that. The lymphatic system is a huge drainage network that collects debris from your um, tissues and bring and clarifies, filters the blood and also allows the immune cells to do their job right there within that um, lymphatic drainage system. So let's go um, through the anatomy. So, right, I feel like I brought you to science class and I have to just for a little bit so you can have an, a, a little bit of an idea of what the lymphatic drainage system looks like and why it's set up to do um, what it does so well. That's just... Okay. So I need you to first, I'm going to show you actually the next slide has a little bit of a there we go. So picture, um, take a look at this picture. You can see that it has lots of vessels and little nodules and nodes and some green looking organs or highlighted green. They're not actually green, but that entire network that you see there on this slide is the lymphatic drainage system. Okay, so it's made up of lymphatic vessels, as you can see, very similar to your blood <laughs> system. Um, we have all of these vessels that run alongside our, our, bl our blood circulatory system, which is our arteries and veins. And then we also have within those vessels, the fluid contained within those vessels called the, lymph the lymphatic fluid or the lymph fluid. It is comprised mostly of bacteria fighting or, or pathogen fighting white blood cells and it runs throughout this entire um, system. And if you look along, it looks like a couple of pit stops, right? They're like little um, bus stops along the way where these nodules are, what we call lymph nodes. These lymph nodes actually are responsible for a lot of the filtration of the lymphatic fluid but also they are major hubs where a lot of our antibodies are created by our white blood cells, okay? If we go further, if you look here, um, we have some lymph organs. These lymphoid organs are major, and there are only two major organs. One of them is your thymus, which you never really hear much about, but your thymus gland lays right here below your breastplate, and its job is to um, house some of your super fighting white blood cells called your T, um, your T cells. If you look further here, just under the left breast there, there's another organ called the spleen. And that organ actually is a huge place where most of your blood passes through and it gets filtered. So that's on your left side under your um, left um, upper abdomen you have this spleen which filters the blood for um, pathogens, especially bacteria, okay? So if you go up here, we have one big nodule up in our um, 
in our face. You see that lady, she, she has a Palatine tonsil and our tonsils, they're not as expendable as people make them seem. They are a major part of this lymphatic um, system, but also a major part of our immunity and our immune health. And the tonsils located in your throat are there to fight off pathogens that enter the body from here. And we can just imagine that a large amount of pathogens actually enter this way, right? Pathogens that may be on our food, pathogens we breathe in, especially when we're thinking about this current situation that we've just been through. And when it comes to catching these quickly, um, your tonsils are actually at the hot spot, okay? If you look further here, highlighted here in your intestines as well as in your bone, there are special lymphoid tissue. So they're not organs that on their own, but they are specialized tissue within um, your intestine and your bone that function as lymphatic tissue. So in your bone marrow, right inside your bones, you produce a lot of your defense cells and also within your um, intestines, you have a lot of cells that work to destroy pathogens that make their way into your bowels, okay? So let's move on past the anatomy um, because we talked about the row earlier, but there was one more. Okay, there we go. So I want you to kind of picture um, this process of how the um, function of the lymphatic system works. So. In, what happens is you your heart pumps blood into your regular circulatory system. We'll follow that through. And as you know, you have these big vessels that leave the heart that branch out into much smaller, smaller arteries and tiny arteries until you get down to the very basis in your tissues, you have these fine networks of capillaries. And these are the tiniest um, blood vessels that you have that are carrying oxygenated blood from your heart. And they're so tiny that they're only about um, one red blood cell width. And so as your little red blood cells are pushing through this very tiny vessel, a lot of the fluid or uh, plasma leaves your blood vessels. That fluid actually bathes your cells and a lot of exchange occurs there, right, at the tissue level. So that fluid comes out and you may have an exchange of nutrients and then cells also dump their waste into that fluid. Now that fluid, a lot of it gets taken back up into your veins, but so much of it gets left um, within that interstitial tissue, so within and around your cells. Now, if it were to stay there, you'll be, you'll probably end up with lots of like swollen um, ankles and fingers and may experience lots of bloating and puffiness, but that's where your lymphatic system comes into place. Its job, it has lots of open-ended vessels right there in that same area where it takes back up a lot of the liquid that gets left behind. And that the opportunity for your body to get that cellular waste that the cells may have dumped out in and around that fluid back into the lymphatic vessels so that it can be filtered, cleansed, and then put back into the system. And if it didn't do that, we've actually um, learned that if we didn't do that, we might find that so much fluid loss would occur that we lose up to two, we would lose up to two liters of fluid a day if our lymphatic system didn't bring that fluid back up out, out of the tissues and, and interstitial know, space. Apparently, the same mom's phone. She left the phone. I'm just attempting to mute any newcomers. Sorry, give me a second. Hopefully, that helps. All right. Okay, so. If we if we left all that fluid down there in this in the tissue at the tissue level, we would have a lot of issues with fluid balance, um, and like I mentioned, the puffiness, the swollen fingers, and bloating, and and those sometimes are the signs that maybe we have a sluggish lymphatic um, system. But most of that fluid gets drawn back up, and we're not left dehydrated because it gets dumped back into after it's been clean and cleared and, and um, bacteria filtered from it back into our system, okay? Let's move on. So 
this is something that most of you would have experienced. Um, having a swim in the nude, right? Like that's what those little green nodules or pit stops, I was calling them little bus stations, those lymph nodes, when you find that one may be swollen, likely it is that your lymphatic system is doing its job. Its job is to notice that there is um, pathogens in your blood stream and your lymph nodes, they get to work to start producing the antibodies that you will require be required to kind of go hunt down and find those pathogens, take them so that your white blood cells can mobilize and get rid of that pathogen. And, and in most cases, that's perfectly normal. It means, yay, let's give our lymphatic um, system a, a, a round of applause because it's doing its job. Now, those things are normally temporary. When you have a swollen lymph node, it may last a week or two, especially if it was a little bit of a flu-like thing. You may experience a little bit of time before that goes away. And all it is is just an inflamed lymph node that had to do a lot of work to deal with whatever pathogen was found. Now, what happens is that we sometimes experience more prolonged issues with swollen lymph nodes, and they can be a little bit more serious. And indicate other issues such as um, we have like tonsillitis that's a really common one that most people have experienced right and that's just like where your tonsils are the inflamed ones and they're working on the extra and and there can be other issues that have related to causing it to be a more prolonged chronic issues and that can sometimes lead to your tonsils being removed and i talked about them being expendable they really are not an important part of our immune system but sometimes it gets to a point where the physicians decide that um they're more trouble to keep what we like to know um make you aware of is that whilst that may be the case, the real issue is that there's probably some chronic inflammation that needs to be addressed at a little bit of a deeper um, level. So um, we have splenomegaly, which is another issue. It's where that spleen organ becomes super enlarged, right? And a large spleen is normally due to a massive viral infection and it can cause a lot of swelling in the spleen, um, as well as lymphomas, right? And so this is when we start moving moving into the far more serious things such as the cancers that start in the lymph nodes and um, cancer of the entire lymphatic system, which is the Hodgkin's disease type disease, um, disease processes, okay? So um, while a swollen lymph node is not something to be super worried about because your lymphatic system's just doing its job, when there are chronic issues, they have to be addressed because they can, it can mean that there's something more sinister going on, okay? So symptoms that you may experience, and, and this slide calls it symptoms of lymphatic fatigue, and, and it's trying to relate to the simple fact that you must have a sluggish lymphatic system. And believe it or not, some of these symptoms can be very common, such as bloating, and we talked about this, bloating, swelling of fingers, puffiness in the face, um, but what is even more indicative of a lymphatic system that needs a little bit more attention, and maybe the body on a whole, of course, because no system um, stands separately in our body, is when you start to have reoccurring infections, right? When you have issues that, you know, you get a cold and then just a few weeks later, you get another cold, right? Um, that's an issue. When you have stiffness in your joints because of this swelling and, and it's a slow roll, then we start to really want to investigate the lymphatic system because we need to distinguish whether or not this is a very serious issue or whether we just have a sluggish lymphatic drainage system that needs some of what we'll talk about soon. So you guys are being very patient for us to get to the good stuff. But you have to understand that there are simple systems like um, symptoms like sinus infection, swelling, and bloating that actually can be indicative of a sluggish lymphatic system. So what can we do about that, right? Um, this is the part we all kind of want to get to. And uh, I almost feel like I'm gonna disappoint you because if, especially for those of you who, who spend a lot of time with us or listening, and thank you, because I see many of you um, are around a lot, but it's the basics that actually help the lymphatic system. And it's always the basics. And when we start to see this common thread, then we start to realize if we're not doing these things, we really need to start doing them. 
So how can you boost your lymphatic drainage system and therefore encourage um, higher immunity? Well, let's find out. It's not that difficult. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna start with water and don't smack me for this. I know everybody's like, oh, Dr. Fame is water again. Yes, it's that important. Um, water is this huge source of how everything functions in our bodies. And it's super important for proper lymphatic fluid movement. Can you just imagine that there was, that the blood volume was low. So therefore, when it got to that little capillary network, not much fluid leaked out. Therefore, there wouldn't be not much fluid that we can dissolve cellular waste into to go back into the lymphatic um, system for drainage. Water is super important. You have to be hydrated and without it, your lymphatic fluid will run slow and it will be sluggish and there, therefore you will not be able to remove as much waste um, through the lymphatic drainage system. Okay, so everybody's water for, a need for water is different and I need you to remember that there is not a, a perfect number for any one person because it changes based on size. It, it changes based on a person's activity. So if you were out running in the heat and I was sitting in air conditioning all day, my R requirements may be different. However, we can always know when we've reached that right amount for us because we have um, clear voluminous <laughs> urine and we don't have um you know really dark orange colored dark yellow colored urine okay so use your urine as a as an indicator but most people can get away with half their body weight in water as a really good start to being um, well hydrated. Some people, if you're going through specific detoxes, like some of our clients are actually on detox regimens, your water intake will actually have to be a little bit higher, okay? If getting enough water is hard for you, I put up this picture, it's mint and I believe that's cucumber, yep, mint and cucumber, you just make it fun. Majority of your water can be plain, um, should be undyed, so no, you know, sparkling dyed um, liquids, but there are some really nice water um, products that have tiny bits of flavor, maybe a little bit of sparkle that you can um, swap in for a glass or two here and there to keep it fun. We love infused water, especially when we use herbs such as mint or rosemary or thyme, because you start to lend these um, other benefits of the antioxidants and the phytochemicals that those herbs actually provide okay so lemon water we love as a first thing in the morning um way to make sure that you're flushing your your gastrointestinal system and therefore your liver but of course all water is welcome we just need to get it in every day in really good amounts okay So this one's not hard to imagine, but I think I need to go back a little bit and explain a little bit of anatomy. So when we think of our blood circulatory system, I mentioned that it starts with a big pump, right? Our heart, it pumps that blood, it gives it momentum, it gets it going. Our arteries actually have muscles that squeeze that blood along so that there is movement, there is active uh, movement in the blood circulatory system. Unfortunately, the lymphatic system was designed a little bit more eco-friendly, right? There is no big electrical pump moving that fluid. That lymphatic system relies solely on movement. Okay, imagine that these are our muscles and we have lymphatic tissue um, veins um, throughout. Every time you squeeze your muscle, we'll be pumping and squeezing that lymphatic um, fluid up where it belongs so that it can go back up to the thoracic duct to be drained um, back into the blood circulatory system. And so it is heavily reliant on you getting up and moving. So while gentle movement is helpful, so walking, and yeah, you don't actually have to do anything super special. You just need to make sure that you're moving. You need to um, walk jog, run, all these simple things, but some really fun ways to really get your lymphatic system or your, your lymphatic fluid flowing is through stretching and yoga. 
Th those simple twists and movements get that get um, squeeze um, the lymphatic fluid in places that you normally wouldn't in your daily movements of walking. So when you're doing super awesome twists and yoga, right, and and you're using different gravity moves like putting the legs up the wall, all of these very different movements actually move the lymph a little bit better than just simply walking around wood. There is one very fun way involving a tiny moment of zero gravity, and that's when you jump on a trampoline or a rebounder, right? Every That jumping movement, which you actually don't have to do vigorously, very much moves the lymph and improves lymphatic drainage, and therefore improves detoxification, and therefore improves your immunity. So let's get moving, okay? That's one of the best things that you can do. Um, to improve your lymphatic drainage. So relieving stress. And the reason this slide is here, you're like, okay, what does that have to do with the lymphatic system? Well, we always include stress in everything. It's simply because we were designed and we have evolved over the last thousands of years just to be in um, operate at our optimal health in less stress than we do in our modern day. So most of us are experiencing lots of stress that we would not have, say, a hundred or thousand years ago, and we need to start accounting for that. Many of the statistics show that 75% or more of the reasons that people visit their physician can be related back to stress-related illnesses. Now that's a huge number. It means every time something's wrong, majority of those times, it's be because we could have prevented it if we were moderating our stress. Our bodies were designed to work in a rest and digest majority situation. Only when we need to run from the lion, the tiger, or the bear, we are supposed to jump into this fight or flight Mode. But it seems like when it comes to traffic and work and getting the kids to school and so many of these daily stressors have changed the way that our body um, operates on a daily basis and we find ourselves more in the fight or flight mode. And so therefore I address stress here because simply it is a factor in almost every disease process. However, many of the stress reducing things you can do, um, activities such as yoga and deep breathing, having good posture, all of these actually also improve lymph flow. Okay, and we're actually gonna talk about breathing because it's a little bit um, special. And whilst I spoke about yoga, I wanted to get to why you wanna deep breathe. <laughs> okay, so, Deep breathing is an, an easy way that, that you can start to reduce stress. And it's, it's so simple. It does not take a lot of time and it doesn't cost any money. We need to do it anyway because we need to oxygenate and we can oxygenate better when we're doing deep breaths. And so I wanted to just describe to you and, and for all of you who actually registered for today's talk, I will make sure I send you an email that has some nice links because today some of the things that you should be doing are simple but they're also you may need some guidance so I'm going to make sure I link a video with which has some of these breaths that you can types of breathing that you can practice so um, you hear about Ujjayi breath a lot um, in yoga, but what I will send you is what's called the three-part breath. So simple, so easy, and the easiest way you can do it, um, the simplest way, is to rest your hand, left hand on your chest, and your right hand on your abdomen, and you want to actually inhale, making sure you move your chest first, and then your upper abdomen until you fill up your belly, and you want to take note of the movement of your hands placed on these areas. So we're gonna breathe in, we're gonna um, move the chest and expand the chest, then the upper abdomen, and then the lower abdomen, making sure that our belly has been filled and blown out to at the most that we can before we start to exhale. And when we do exhale, we wanna go in the reverse, okay? We wanna um, release first your belly, and then your up lower abdomen, and then your chest at your upper abdomen. And before you start any breathing activity, it's really good to first just practice short Boats at first, but before you even get into the activity, take the time to kind of find a nice 
quiet spot, take a few kind of relaxing breaths before you practice the, um, the deep breathing exercise. And that's what I promised to link to you in an email, okay, after this, because we have just a few more things to get through. And actually your lymphatic system, it actually drains like 15% better when you have a deep breath. So just by deep breathing and activating like your diaphragm, you actually cause a big release and flow of the lymphatic tissues, I mean drain, um, lymphatic fluid from those tissues as well as activating some of the lymph nodes to produce some white blood cells, okay? So this is super fun. Brush it away. <laughs> and it's so simple, so easy. The lymphatic fluid actually is easily moved by light touch. And if you went to a masseuse who did a lymphatic drainage massage, they won't be pounding you and rubbing the deep muscles. They would not do that. They would be using very light touch, maybe some specific um, touch to the lymphatic nodes. But other than that, it's very light touch to move the limb. And that's because a lot of the lymphatic um, vessels actually lie just beneath your skin. And this is why we use dry brushing as a way to encourage lymphatic fluid flow. Okay, so you draw, if you see this slide, it has a dry brush there and it's made of natural bristles. So you don't want to purchase one that has plastic bristles. And you can use the handheld one that is pictured there or the kind that has a longer handle so that you can reach other areas such as your back and your lower legs without bending down too far if that's difficult for you. So what you want to do once you have your dry brush is you want to make sure your skin is dry. This is not something you use in the shower. You will start at your feet and using very light strokes, stroke your skin lightly about 10 times in each area and we'll stroke upwards towards your heart. Okay, so you start with the legs and then you'll move to your arms and stroke towards your, your heart. And not only is this super awesome for your lymphatic um, flow, but it's also great for your skin. And by using this light brush, it actually can improve the collagen in your skin. It can actually help your skin to lose, you know, exfoliate that top layer. So it actually looks a little bit more bright and beautiful, but it can also start to make your skin look a little bit younger. So that's a special bonus, but lymphatic drainage is our goal. And when you get to your torso, you want to make sure you're doing circular motions. It's very difficult to brush upwards like over your belly. So we do circular motions and we avoid areas like your face because the skin on the face can be very sensitive, but you can do your neck skin. Um, this is a practice you would do. It just takes a few minutes before a show and then you jump in because just now you would have exfoliated an entire layer of your skin and then you'll be nice to shower it off, okay? So dry brushing, remember if you're doing it too hard, you're not doing it right, it should not hurt. Um, so just keep it light and, and you can pick these up right at your pharmacies. It's not difficult um, to purchase a brush and then get started with lymphatic um, drainage via dry brushing. So get cozy. <laughs> Whilst hugging may improve your limp, this is actually about the clothing that you wear. Um, I, I come from a family of a lot of girls, so there is the distinctive, you know, you walk in the door, you unsnap your bra and pull it out from your, from your um, shirt and just get rid of that tight feeling that you've been, you know, tolerating all day. And so this is all about that. It's about not restricting the flow of the lymphatic vessels. Remember I just said that a lot of those lymphatic vessels lay just under your skin. So tight clothing can actually prevent a lot of lymphatic flow. And whilst a lot of people, especially when exercising or if they already have lymphatic uh, um, lymph drainage issues, may be using constrictive wear, such as compression garments for the athletes or compression wear for patients that are actually having issues with their lymphatic system. Everyone else has very little need to be wearing tight clothing. So as soon as you can, as soon as you get home, 
um, you want to change into something really comfortable so that as you're moving about in your home, you can actually start to move that limp a little bit better because no longer will it be constricted um, by the tight clothing that you're wearing. So that's a nice, simple, easy daily thing you can do. Of course, I was going to talk about eating, right? Because um, nutrition is the core of almost everything. Um, however, when it comes to lymphatic drainage, what is it special that we can do? Always, um, I always talk about first, if you are cleaning up something like um, the lymphatic vessels do. Sorry, hold on. Let me move my notes. Sorry. Okay, so diet plays a huge role, right? And it's simple. And it's the same thing that I say always. You have to first eliminate the garbage from coming in. If you're going to spend all this time improving your lymphatic drainage, trying to remove toxins, then you really want to make sure that you don't keep putting it in. And so the number one way to do that is to clean up your diet. And we always encourage people to switch from processed foods to whole foods. And of course it gets a little bit more complicated than that, but not really. So you don't want to process foods. Those are things that have dyes and preservatives, things that may contain high fructose corn syrup and start reading your labels because that's the only way you're going to know if, that, if those foods are contained in your diet. If you're eating things that are pre-made in a box, you, you want to start moving away from that to things that are more whole food based, okay? Bad fats and, and grains. So I hate to give grains such a bad rap, but they have one all on their own. So many grains like wheat, even our um, oats and rice can be sprayed so heavily with toxins that it's not even the grain itself anymore. At this point, it's how many chemical toxins are contained on them. And unfortunately, when we grow wheat or we grow rice or um, oats, it's not like these things get washed off before they find themselves um, at the meal being ground into the flours and then therefore the, the baked goods that we eat with them. So I want to encourage people to reduce their grain consumption. You don't have to be completely gluten-free and dairy-free. I would encourage it, but being gluten-free kind of automatically eliminates some of the heavy toxic chemicals that are used on wheat, but I would encourage people going a step further and just reducing their grains in general, which are your rice and corn and oats. It doesn't mean none, but I would definitely work on eliminating majority of that. Clean meats, we always talk about this. It's the same issue of having a healthy animal that's going to produce healthier meats, and you really start wanting, you really want to start paying attention to where your meat comes from, how it was raised, because it's going to affect the quality of the meat and therefore your health, okay? You want to focus on massively increasing, increasing your vegetable intake. I get so tired of saying this, but I will continue to do it just for you. You have to eat vegetables. <laughs> You have to eat a massive amount of vegetables. Most people are not getting enough. I want you to take a look at your fist and I want you to say, I need to get something like eight to 12 servings a day. That sounds like a lot because most people are not really even getting um, barely two to three servings a day, okay? So work on your vegetable intake. And this is the thing, it can be difficult for people to eliminate um, food. So we just encourage that you choose a food, choose what you're going to work on and do it slowly over time. Yes, there are times where it's called for for people to make drastic changes overnight simply because their health relies on it. But most of us can take our time and say, okay, you know what, I'm going to start eating less of this and more of that. And you just choose what it is within your bandwidth, your capability of doing that. Okay. Let's move on. So when it comes to um, your diet, I just like to encourage people to start with a nutrient-packed -pack breakfast. And yes, there is a smoothie there. There is no denying it. I truly believe that if most people did that one thing and swapped breakfast for a super nutrient-packed smoothie that contained um, antioxidant-rich fruits like berries 
and some greens, rather it be whole spinaches and kales or green powders even, like that contain barley grass or spirulina and chlorella. If you just do that with a good quality protein powder, a plant-based protein powder, I'll clarify, you can actually so help your body eliminate toxins better. You can balance your blood sugars. You can probably lose some weight simply by just changing your breakfast to make sure that it's something nutrient dense. Because it's a smoothie, you've done one extra thing by reducing the work of digestion that your body has to do. So sometimes we have to think of it as workload, right? If I'm going to be doing extra eliminating of toxins, I need to do less of something else and it could be digesting a meal. So digesting a meal still takes energy and work and by replacing your breakfast with a smoothie, you've but you've done both you've eliminated toxins you've added those awesome antioxidants that are required for super awesome health and then you have um, provided your body with something that's easy to digest okay um, I'm gonna quickly go through lunch and dinner because the concept is the same for both of them unlike breakfast where I was just telling you to swap it completely for a nice nutrient-packed smoothie. Lunch and dinner are, are opportunities to get that massive amount of vegetable intake in. And so I would encourage you at lunch and dinner to really focus on how you can fill your plate with veggies, a good quality protein, and if you do use a carbohydrate, that it be a grain-free one, like a sweet potato, or even white potato at this point, because we just need to reduce how much grains we actually in, take in and of course when I talk vegetable intake I'm talking about possibly being sure that you're making um, an effort to buy organic when possible or grow your own because there is a caveat with that if you increase your vegetable intake but they're all covered in pesticides and herbicides you could technically be exposing yourself to a massive amount of toxins so if you're not buying organic you really need to make sure you're washing well with some sort of um, detergent design for cleaning vegetables because you really want to make sure you've removed a massive amount of toxins that will be there. I, I just looked at some tomatoes in this store and I was like, man, these are so perfect. I almost don't want to buy them because they didn't say they were organic. And I just know that if they look that perfect, it means that there weren't no ca any caterpillars. <laughs> and therefore it meant that it was probably covered in, in toxic um, chemicals to keep the caterpillars away. So you have to think about that when you cannot buy organic be sure to make um, make an effort to clean that toxic chemical layer off as best as possible same with dinner massive amount of vegetables I want to encourage people to monitor their protein intake and um, keep the grains very minimum so if you are including grains like a brown rice or something like that try to buy organic and try to make it a very small portion of your meal um, snack attack. So when changing your diet, that can always be a challenge, right? Your body is so used to having like snacks here and there because, and a lot of times we snack because our bodies are begging for nutrients. And if we didn't have nutrient dense meals, then we, we have this emptiness that we need to feel. Our body is still asking for nutrients. And therefore you wanna make sure when you're transitioning your diet that you still allow yourself snacks. Of course, I'm not taking snacks away, that's for sure. But what you wanna do is make sure that you change your snacks to be super healthy. And so fruits are always a great option simply because they're another opportunity to get antioxidants in. Veggie snacks are awesome, but that's not always like feasible or kid friendly. And when you do need to get that crunch or that salty taste, there are, there are so many nice alternatives like um, chickpeas, snacks or kale with that's been dehydrated and so crispy um kale chips but even as far as just swapping your regular stuff for maybe a sweet potato chip okay i'm not saying you have to go um extreme but i feel like making lots of small changes can really bring about a lot of improvement things like date balls chocolate date balls can actually satisfy your chocolate cravings but also give you something nice and sweet in a very healthy way 
Okay, so my this is my last really work slide for you. Um, this says fight inflammation with turmeric, and that is a big part of what the immune system does, and therefore your lymphatic system, because it's such a big part of your immune system, it fights inflammation. And that inflammation occurs every time it's aggravated by a pathogen, it activates those lymph nodes that we talked about, and you can immediately assist your body with this inflammation, because when we reduce inflammation, we improve the flow of the lymphatics, and turmeric is known um, to do that really well. Turmeric can be found in so many um, foods. However, you can make a special effort to include it directly as a capsule, which is, is super fine for anybody who just wants to get it in. But this picture here is a nice chai latte that has turmeric in it, so what we call golden milk maybe. And we have a recipe for that on, on the blog. Maybe I'll link that to you in the email. Really nice way to have a yummy anti-inflammatory evening tincture. It will actually help you to sleep really well as, as well. So the other way you can get turmeric is in the actual spice and put it in your food. So it's, it doesn't have a strong flavor, so it's really easy to include. And the more spices and herbs that you include in your diet, you automatically are improving your anti-inflammatory capability. So I encourage people to change and try out herbs when you're making your meals, just add it in. Turmeric will make you, you know something yellow, so if you want some yellow chicken, you can put turmeric on it with some really nice Indian spices, and then you have an entire baked meal that's different from what you normally would. Um, turmeric can also be found in an essential oil blend as well. So that's nice. You can diffuse it, but you can also rub it onto um, in, in mix and dilute it, of course, onto your um, areas that are inflamed. So turmeric is something we always encourage, just whether it's food-based as a supplement or capsule or as an essential oil, like I, like I mentioned. Okay. So now you're off. Ideally, um, I, let's see what the time looks like. Okay, so I will look and see if there are any major questions that I can answer for you right away um, before we head out. Let's see. Um, I, I have a question. Are you taking questions now or later? I can. You go ahead. So the things like the turmeric, um, most times I will pick up my turmeric in the grocery store from off the shelf. So is that is that okay, that turmeric? So or should we be or should we be looking for the fresh in the um, produce section? So there are benefits to both. Um, when you think about the fresh um, root that looks similar to garlic, um, but it's a little bit orangey looking, right? That has benefits of how you wish to prepare it. So when I make a, a fresh tea, I like to use the the root when when available. The the part of the part or the issue with having a fresh all the time is that we live in Bermuda. Or no matter where you live, it's not always in season. So when you can get it fresh, it's really nice um, to incorporate into um, steeped things like tea because you're not really damaging the root in any way or the active compounds in it because you're just steeping it in warm water. Um, so that's the, that's the one ben benefit of being able to use fresh. And anytime you use something fresh, there are going to be more activated en enzymes and um, the chemicals and phytochemicals would not have been destroyed at all, except for that it's not as fresh as when it was picked. It might have degraded a little bit. And that's the, also the benefit of the dried. Normally, if you have good quality dried turmeric, even if it's on your spice shelf, like you mentioned, sorry, um, then you will find that um, those things were picked when they were optimal and then therefore dried soon after. And that's also a benefit, right? Because you have preserved the um, benefits of the root when it was straight in season. I actually encourage to look for a brand that's organic. So I know we have not much choice on our shelves, right? So there's McCormick Organic. Um, and you would even just look at the different brands and you can see the difference in the yellow color and you would see that some look a little bit better than others. I know that 
I think it's Caribbean spices. Their quality of spice is actually pretty good. Um, so I would stick to two, those two brands. One that you can surely get organic. That way we know that it hasn't been sprayed heavily um, because it is a ground, um, a ground root and therefore it can absorb toxins from the ground. So organic's always nice. Um, I, I just think if people are using it rather than not using it, it's always best. The other thing with turmeric is it's also good to include with um, black pepper at the same time, which is why a lot of the yellow uh, golden milks and the chai lattes that include turmeric always have black pepper in it. That's ancient Ayurvedic medicine. That's just how it was designed because black pepper actually helps with the absorption of turmeric um, and makes it actually more bioavailable as well as why it's always um, a tiny bit of fat included. So normally you would see in those recipes coconut um, oil being used as a way to help with the absorption and the bioavailability of the herb when you use it. Okay. Thank you very much. One more question before someone asks. Someone once said to me, garlic um, can damage the stomach lining or it, no, sorry, it will compromise the blood vessels if you have it too much. Have you heard something similar? Okay, so garlic is um, a really um, good herb and for many reasons it has so many benefits now if you're talking about dropping garlic crushed garlic cloves down your throat all at once you can see how that can maybe aggravate your your gut right because it is a very strong herb um, there are a couple of ways that you want to include garlic depending on your gut health issues so garlic actually can help and hinder certain gut conditions at the same time. So I know for a lot of people who are on special diets for overgrowth of bacteria, they we actually put them on a garlic supplement, but it's the garlic extract only, not the actual whole herb itself. And that's because some of the um, glycosaminoglycan, some of the um, carbohydrates contained within the actual root, the actual meat of the root can be uh, um, encouraging to those bacteria that we're actually trying to kill off. So whilst garlic can be used as an antimicrobial, antifungal, in its strongest form it can damage a very delicate um, digestive tract. So it really just depends on the health of a person. I always encourage people to at, at least utilize it in some way, shape, or form unless they find that it aggravates them. Everyone's individual, you have to pay attention to your individual reactions, okay? I don't see any, okay, so what does it mean when your tonsil are inflamed on a regular basis? So that's when we talked about earlier, um, when you have infection of your tonsils and it carries on for a long time, it just means that your body's immune system may not be able to overcome some of its other, um, I wanna call it challenges really. So. I mentioned diet and I mentioned diet all the time because imagine if you're intolerant to dairy and you're eating grains that are covered in chemicals. This becomes a real like checklist of things that your body has to deal with. And so if you haven't tried eliminating certain foods to reduce the amount of inflammation that's surely happening because of the way you eat, and, and then on top of that, your body may have, you might be dehydrated, so now you're your lymphatic fluids now um, not flowing as well. And we talked about how important the flow is. So, so many of us are dehydrated. So many of us are eating foods that actually inflame our guts and therefore put us into this inflamed state. And on top of that, so many of us are not resting. So many of us are stressed. And we start to build this load of things that our body has to deal with. It may just be that your tonsils are showing you that you're under some sort of chronic strain and it's manifesting itself as oh, you have tonsillitis and it's been happening over and over again every few months, right? But it may just be that so many of your other systems are not working optimally. And when you start to weed through that, you start to clean up your diet, move your limbs, include water, reduce your stress. And I know the list is long, but that's the same list that your body's dealing with whilst we expect it to work optimally, okay?
So I would encourage that person who asks about their tonsils to start modifying some of the other areas, improving dehydration, just the simple things that actually improve lymphatic drainage. So it says, what about using organic grains? Do they still have pesticides? So I went to a lecture one time and the physician was saying, oh, you know, eat organic, blah, blah, blah. But don't worry, at organic farms, when the wind blows or when it rains, really cute little umbrellas come up and cover those plants. And it's just not true, right? And for a second, I was just listening so intently. I didn't catch that he was making a joke, of course. <laughs> But the reality is that does not happen. Little umbrellas don't come up and cover um, our organic vegetables. So there are wind drafts and rain and, and that is shared. Like organic farms could literally be down the road from a non-organic farm. And so there's still going to be less, of course, if you use organic grains, but you want to just minimize where your toxins are coming from in general. And if you do a great job of doing that in every other area of the food you eat, then maybe eating some organic grains is really not a big deal. And this is why it's very individualized, okay? Um, I'm querying. Toxins that come along, it seems, every month. So, Tons, the, the, I, this is outside of my realm of expertise and I have heard about these tonsil stones. However, I really feel like unless you've addressed some of those other issues, because when I think stones, especially because they happen also in the kidney and the gallbladder, dehydration is such a big issue and it solves so many issues. We have to start thinking about all of our systems and how they're working in, in unison. And because stones that may occur in the tonsils or the kidneys or the gallbladder, they can be a culmination of all of these other things that we're not doing right, such as um, taking care of our diet, making sure it's clean, also encouraging that we're having enough water. So I will say that that's not my area of expertise, but I do know that unless we're ticking some other boxes, it can be quite difficult to identify what the root cause of a certain issue is without having done those that checklist. Okay, I really appreciate all of you being here. So many of you, thank you so much for your questions. If you have any more, um, uh, you can send them via email, but I promised you an email, which will have both the recording. Um, oh, for a second, I panicked. I didn't know if I pressed the recording button. <laughs> so I'll, I'll send you the recording of today, as well as the email that has um, the link to the um, three-part breath, which I encourage everyone to practice. We all live in a very stressful world, and it's important to have tools to combat that. And I may include some other things, like some um, links to smoothie recipes and things like that, and the chai, chai latte. Oh, hi, Miss Stewart, you had a question? Yes, um, when you dry brush on your neck, do you still go up? No, 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 always down towards the heart, yes. So you literally are going to take it and gently do this way, yeah? And when you get to your torso, you start doing big circles this way towards your arm, um, towards your heart. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, all of you, for joining. I really enjoy seeing your faces, too. Hi, everybody. <laughs> okay, so I, hi, Angie. <laughs> so I will send you an email today at, with the recording of today's session in case you missed something and you needed to go back. Um, I appreciate your presence, and I hope that all of you will get that lymph flowing, okay? Bye.